Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Work Zone Safety Information Clearinghouse webinar on the new Federal Highway Regulation on High Visibility Clothing. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to take a minute to announce that the 2009 National Traffic Management and Work Zone Safety Conference offered by the Clearinghouse will be held March 10th through 12th in Orlando, Florida. Uh, for the first time, the Work Zone Conference is going to be held in conjunction with World of Asphalt and the Ag One Show, so there will be a lot to see and to learn in Orlando. So plan on being there in March. Today, now, I'd like to introduce our speakers for the webinar. First, we'll hear from Mr. Hari Kala, and he'll be followed by Janice Comer Bradley. I'll introduce Hari at this time, and then I'll introduce Janice before she speaks following Hari. Hari is the MUTCD team leader for the Federal Highway Administration. And before taking that position, he worked in the FHWA Office of Safety for a number of years. He's been with the Federal Highway Administration for seven years, and before that was eight years with the New York Department of Transportation. So we're very pleased to have Hari with us today. Go ahead, Hari. Thank you, Brad. Um, just before we came online, um, <clears throat> Brad Sent, told me that there, there are 1,500 registration for this uh, conference. Um, and to be honest with you, it's a little uh, disconcerting to know that there are 15 or 1,600 people listening to you and watching you and in this room where I'm speaking to you, there are only four or five people. Uh, so with that note, uh, let's get started. Um, the, what I'm going to talk to you about, I will give you a brief update, uh, it's a very um, uh, few minutes uh, update on the why we did this rule, uh, what process we used to do this rule, and then spend most of my time on talking about the content of the rule and uh, some next steps and what are some of the issues with this rule. From my perspective, the main takeaway for of this presentation is the uh, content of the rule and how it will apply to, uh, to you. Uh, in 2005, uh, Congress passed a, a very uh, major transportation bill called Safety Lou. Uh, the Safety Lou stands for uh, Safe, Accountable, Flexible, Efficient uh, Transportation Equity Act uh, Legacy for User. And as a part of that uh, law, the Congress gave the federal highways this requirement to issue regulation uh, on this worker visibility. And the language of the, the safety loop language, the, the language we got from the Congress, is up on the screen. But as a part of this uh, congressional mandate, what Congress didn't tell us, or we didn't get uh, a lot of guidance from the Congress, is the, how to define the worker or what they meant by the worker and the high visibility garment and the, what it means to be in the close proximity of the uh, Federal Aid Highway. So uh, we spent a lot of time um, researching this topic and uh, coming up with what we thought is a rational and logical uh, definition of the worker uh, and the uh, high visibility garment, garments. So, and we also, as a part of our research, we talked to a lot of stakeholders. Um, and once we did our research, uh, we, in April 2006, uh, we issued the proposed rule. The proposed rule was um, published in the Federal Register and uh, we opened that up for the public comments for a few weeks. And we, get, we got the, quite a bit of comments. We got over more than uh, 125 comments on this uh, rule. And we did the our analysis of the comments, and based on our analysis uh, and our research, we published the final rule uh, on November 24, 2006. And we kind of gave a pretty extend, extended uh, deadline effective uh, deadline for this rule, and the, the rule goes in effect on November 24th of this year. And the reason uh, we had this two years, uh, to give uh, agencies uh, time to uh, get in compliance with this rule. Now let's talk about the, uh, the content of the rule, what's in the rule. And this is a, just a snapshot of the Federal Register notice um, uh, uh, when we published it, uh, got, when the final rule got published. And by the way, the 23 CFR, the CFR stands for uh, Code of Federal Regulation, and 23 CFR is the compilation of all the highway-related uh, regulations. And the Part 60, 634 is the where this high visibility requirement rule resides. Well, in a nutshell, this is the language of the rule you see on the screen right now that all workers while working within the public right-of-way of the federal aid highways 
who are exposed to either traffic or the construction equipment uh, shall wear the high visibility uh, safety apparel. And as a part of this rule, we provided uh, some definitions. And the, the definition of worker, uh, as you can see, is uh, pretty inclusive. It includes the all workers whose work, whose work responsibility place them in public right of way. Uh, and actually, the underlying language you see, that's the exception uh, we included in the final rule. And that's based on the, the lots and lots of comments we got from the law enforcement agencies that when they're doing the uh, uh, law enforcement duties, like um, police chase and stuff, uh, sometimes it can be harmful to wear those high visibility garments. So for that reason, we created this exception for law enforcement, and they are required to wear high visibility garment only when uh, they are doing the traffic control duties. And also, there's a, uh, we have received a lot of questions that what is the Federal Aid Highway? The uh, Federal Aid Highway is any road which is on the Federal Aid system, and um, it's if you go to your any um, your state highway department or tra department of transportation, they should be able to provide you um, the more guidance on the, which road is on the federal aid system and which is not. Uh, the official definition is that all roads uh, are considered on the federal aid system except the uh, local roads and the rural minor collectors. Um, again, uh, when it's looking at the more definitions, the uh, for the definition of a uh, high visibility garment, uh, we did quite a bit of research, and the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices have used uh, ANSI standards uh, before, and the ANSI standards are considered well accepted and well recognized standard for the high visibility garment. So we decided to use the, uh, at that time, what was the latest standard, which is uh, ANSI 107-2004. And the requirement we have in this rule is the class two or class three. Uh, Janice Badley, who will talk to you about these standards uh, later on and give you a whole lot more details. So I'm not going to cover that. And we also looked at the, what it means to be in close proximity of the uh, federal aid highways. And the best definition, uh, more rational or logical definition we could come up with is the uh, pub public right of way of the federal aid highways. So in the nutshell, um, this rule, worker visibility rule, requires the ANSI 107 2004 class two or class three safety garment for all workers within the right of ways of federal aid highways, with the, with the one minor exception for the law enforcement officers. And the definition of worker, again, it's, a, it's a all inclusive. And the, one of the reasons for that was that we wanted to uh, extend this, this safety benefit to all workers, regardless where they work and what kind of work they do. So what are the next steps? Where do we go from here? The, our plan is the, uh, uh, there is a federal standard for all the traffic control devices and the, the, uh, for all roads open to public travel, and it's called the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. So our plan is to include this worker visibility rule in that manual on uniform traffic control device standard. Uh, the, the MUTCD, as we call it, uh, it is a federal standard and federal regulation. And it will pretty much will do the same thing uh, what the uh, worker visibility rule does, but the two minor exceptions. One is that the, uh, the worker visibility rule as it stands today, it only applies to the federal aid highways. But by including uh, in the MUTCD, what we are proposing that we extend this rule, scope of this rule to all roads open to public travel. And also with this uh, inclu inclusion, what we are proposing to do is to create an option for law enforcement and the uh, officers and the first responders that if they want, they, they can choose, they can opt, they, can, they have this option to choose this a new ANSI public safety garment which is the ANSI 207, uh, 2006. Again, Janice will talk to you what the standard is uh, in a whole lot more detail later on. So with the, the, these two um, additions or exceptions, uh, the, uh, co the, the content of the rule will remain same when we include in the METCD. So uh, when I talked about the METCD, we are going through that process, revising the METCD right now. 
uh, we again we have to follow the same rulemaking process. So we published the, our proposed uh, changes to the MUTCD in January, and the deadline for the public comments closed on July 31st, 2008. And uh, so we had the opportunity. I had the opportunity to look at the what kind of comments we were getting. And our initial assessment is that we have received thousands and thousands of comments, I think they're close to uh, 15,000 comments on our proposal. And, um, I, and so just the first assessment, I've seen a lot of comments from the firefighters on this in this, uh, our proposal with the high visibility carbon. And I can assure you that we'll be looking at all the comments very closely, we'll be analyzing it, and then we, are develop, we will be developing the final rule. And by the way, if you want to look at what our proposal is on the screen, you see our website address and the, all the, uh, our proposals with respect to the next edition of the MUTCD, it's posted on our uh, website. So I strongly encourage you to go and look at it and give us your feedback. Uh, again, as I said, that um, we will be reviewing now the next step in the MUTCD process is that we'll be looking at the comments and developing the final rule. Our goal is to uh, have the final rule, next edition of the MUTCD, published sometime in next year. Uh, we are not quite sure the exact timeline because just because the, uh, the number of comments we have gotten so far. Uh, but once we publish the final rule, again, the agencies will have two years to, um, to adapt to the uh, changes in the MUTCD. So uh, these are the, this is the, what we are looking forward to in the coming few months. They, while we were developing this, after we have developed this rule, I have received the many, many calls on this rule. And uh, there are a couple of issues which keep on coming. One is the, um, what is the standard? Is it the ANSI NSI 107-2004? Or is ANSI 2007-2006? Uh, well, the, uh, when we did this, our rule, our, uh, this um, worker visibility rule, um, the, 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 the most current standard at that time was the ANSI 107-2004. And the ANSI 2007 standard was in draft form. So we could not have, we couldn't consider that rule, uh, that standard for our rule. So the, what you see in the, our worker visibility rule, the standard is 107-2004, not 2007. Uh, but as I said, that we are, we are proposing to provide an option for law enforcement folks to use 2007 in the next edition of the METCD. But that rule is not done. So as stands today, the standard is 107-2004. And also, we have received a number of uh, calls from the uh, uh, different uh, firefighter groups and the companies asking whether this rule applies to them or not. And the, the simple answer is it does, because we did not make that exception. The only exception we have in this rule is for law enforcement officers. Uh, so as it stands today, the, this rule does apply to the firefighters as well as all the other workers. And now, uh, just want to give you, show you some um, photos which kind of brings out this point, that why the, uh, this high visibility is so important uh, on when you're working on the, on the roads. Here's a picture taken uh, during a European scan. I forget which country, but it's a, this is what the, the typical crash scene looks like in Europe. And you see all these uh, high visibility garments, uh, the, all different um, incident responders are wearing. And this is a, just a, oops. Now this is the, just recently, the picture recently taken in one of our streets. And you see the difference. Also, you see in the, some of the police officers in this picture are wearing a high visibility garment, but you probably don't see, or it's not very clear, there is another gentleman standing there, but he doesn't have a um, high visibility garment. So you see the contrast and difference um, in the visibility when you're wearing these uh, high visibility garment and when you're not. Uh, when you're working on the crash scenes or work zones, there, there's a lot of distraction. There's a whole lot of lights and a lot of activities taking place and that usually the drivers are somewhat distracted. And if, you, uh, if the workers are not wearing the high visibility garment, um, it's, it makes a big safety hazard for them. And again, this is the, what the new um, public safety garments they look like. 
And here's the uh, comparisons. Uh, you see the, on the one side is a 107 and one is a 207 uh, garment. And again, the, the, this is the this standard 207 was developed for the uh, public safety uh, officials and the shorter lengths allow them access to the items on their belt. And this is, finally, this, the, this whole the, the debate and this rule is all about the safety. And you see this on your screen that um, the tow truck driver, he was not, by the way, he was not wearing the high visibility garment and he died. Uh, and I just recently saw the data that the, for past 11 years, the more than half, more than 50% of all the law enforcement um, fatalities occur in the traffic related incidents. And, and also, from the construction point of view, there are more than 100 workers die and they're working in the uh, work zones every year. So it is a, it is a big safety issue. And the Congress, um, and that therefore the Congress gave us this direction to do this rule. And finally, again, you see in this worker wearing uh, high visibility garment, and then there is a gentleman standing uh, next to it, uh, not wearing the garment. And you see the, the difference in the visibility but then you probably did not notice that there's a uh, police officer standing next to it with no garment. So you can see how easily, when you have these crash scenes, how easily it's, uh, uh, drivers can distract it and can miss uh, somebody who's not wearing the high visibility garment. So uh, finally, I mean, this rule is all about safety. Uh, and and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, getting, I, I have received a lot of comments from the different agencies. Uh, I get calls, and emails, and letters every day. Uh, from uh, many of you, and I continue to work with you to help you uh, meet, uh, bring your, your, you in the compliance of this rule. And again, I'm looking uh, forward to a great dialogue on this issue. Uh, thank you so much. And here's uh, my contact information. Uh, if you need to reach me, you have my email address and the, my phone number as well as my website address. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hari. We appreciate your presentation. Um, I, as, uh, explained to me that I forgot to introduce myself as we began the webinar. And my name is Bradley Sant, Vice President of Safety for the American Road and Transportation Builders Association. And myself, along with several others here and several others at the Texas Transportation Institute, manage the Works on Safety Information Clearinghouse. Next, we are going to hear from Janice Comer Bradley. And Janice is the Technical Director for the International Safety Equipment Association in Arlington, Virginia. The International Safety Equipment Association, or also known as ISEA, um, is the secretariat for the ANSI 107 and 207 High Visibility Apparel Standards. Um, Janice has been with ISEA for 12 years and has a lot of experience. Many of us know her for many circles. So we'd now like to turn the time over to Janice as soon as she gets her microphone set. Thank you. Hello, I'm Janice Comer Bradley, and I'm very happy to be with you today in Harry Calla to bring you some vital information on reducing fatalities and incidents and injuries on the uh, roads in the United States. Hopefully, uh, as Harry said, this is all about safety for um, people who have to do work on roadways and assist others. So um, let's get started. I'm going to talk to you today about the ANSI ISEA 107 standard, uh, 2004 is the most current edition, as well as give you some information about the two ANSI ISEA 207 standard, which was published in 2006 and should be included in the next revision of the MUTCD. Um, the ANSI ISEA 107 standard, 2004, is the standard for high visibility, safety apparel, and headwear. It is not the um, first edition of the standard. The first edition of the standard was 107-1999, and it was the first one in, actually in the United States that incorporated performance requirements into a single garment for day and nighttime conspicuity. Uh, the standard specifies performance requirements um, for apparel as well as headwear, and it's really designed to provide PPE, um, and we refer to these, these things in the, throughout the standard as items. Uh, it establishes requirements for color and minimum areas, and that's really important. Um, there is no specific one color. I get a lot of questions on do I have to use lime or orange. 
And the, the answer is you need to select a color that provides the greatest background conspicuity between the work zone and the people working in it. For all intents and purposes, um, within roadway work, as if you are competing with orange cones and other orange devices, you may want to choose something that's more along the lines of the lime green, yellow type of garment. If you're working on a road that is near foliage, trees, bushes, and grass, you may want to choose a, an orange garment. So these are the types of evaluations that need to take place when you're selecting color. It also establishes minimum areas, and that is the minimum areas for retroreflective material and background material that you can view a person at 1,000 feet. It also establishes minimum washing cycles, it cites test methods for um, materials, and it states that the retroreflective material should be placed in such a manner as to provide 360 degree visibility of the wearer. And that's really a critical component of both the um, 107 standard and the 207 standard. So that the placement of retroreflective material, which is the material that provides visibility during the nighttime, is not placed all in one area so that if an individual turns to the side or bends over, that they can still be seen. The 107 standard establishes garment performance classes based on certain um, hazard criteria. And it emphasizes that garment selection should be faced based on the assessment of the work environment. And it does recommend some design um, there's a design section as well. But I get most questions on the types of assessment that you should be making for your own employees or for selecting for yourself. And these are some of the things, some of the variables that really are very different from work zone to work zone, from site to site, and for different work environments. And that's the speed of the traffic through the work zone or through the area. Uh, the 1999 version of the standard had speed limits associated with each um, performance class type, but we eliminated those in the 2004 version of the standard based on a, a couple things. Uh, that, was, that was the only criteria that people were using for selection, and it really probably is the least important criteria. And also, most people exceed the posted speed limit, and so in, in some areas it really it didn't make any difference at all. So um, the speed of the traffic uh, through the work zone or through the work area, the amount of traffic, um, different times of the day there's different, um, there's different task loads. Uh, is the work taking place day or night? Uh, what is the activity? Um, are, are there other construction vehicles, other struck by hazards that occur within the roadway area? Um, what type of activity is being performed? How much attention does the individual, can they pay to oncoming traffic and other activities and other struck by hazards? If the task load is high, uh, most of their attention is devoted to what they are doing as opposed to oncoming vehicles. And also, uh, Harry mentioned this, the proximity of the work to the traffic. And is there any separation of the traffic to the individual, a Jersey barrier, for example. So garment selection should focus on risk exposure assessment, the task load, the nature of the work, the color and complexity of the work, the environment, and also lighting. Um, is the area well lit? Or is it you know, a very, very dark roadway? So um, performance class three is considered for the most in, in severe environments. It offers the greatest amount of background and fluorescent and retroreflective material. Performance class two is for moderate uh, to severe environments, and there's a, a balance of fluorescent and retroreflective materials. And then lastly, performance class one is for low risk environments um, and has the lowest level of retroreflective combined performance material as well as the least amount of area. Um, to get a performance class three garments, you can achieve it in several different ways. There's um, what's referred to as a class three ensemble, which can take a class two vest and combine it with a class E bottom for a class three ensemble. Uh, you can also achieve a class three garment through a jacket, a, a coat, um, a torso covering garment with a full or partial sleeve. Um, and some examples for, of class three, uh, and so this is certainly not all inclusive, 
but roadway and construction personnel, flagger, flagger, survey, emergency response. Anyone that has a high task load and is, and is in close proximity to traffic, vehicles, uh, construction vehicles, struck by hazards, and, uh, and others. Uh, very high speeds, um, work occurs at night, the attention to um, oncoming traffic is diverted by the surrounding environment, um, and also a complicated work zone. Highly cluttered, a lot of things going on, um, airport tarmacs and other things. These are just some examples of class three. Um, class two garments. Um, there's a greater visibility uh, needed due to inclement weather conditions. Usually there's complex and, complex and cluttered backgrounds. Most work is performed during the day and the worker has some ability to um, pay attention to oncoming traffic. Uh, some of these are forestry operations, some of the things that you might not think about um, in addition since we're just talking about roadways here. But forestry, ship cargo um, areas, they are very complex environment. Construction workers, utility survey crews, uh, certainly first responders, railroad workers, um, and some school crossing guards that are in um, higher, denser populated areas with traffic going at, at greater speeds. Here's some examples of, um, you, know, you can achieve it for class three by a t-shirt. Um, you know, these are kind of a, a collared shirt, um, a, a straight vest. You can see on that vest that it has um, the ability to uh, attach a microphone or some kind of um, communication device on the shoulder. This particular class two um, vest has the ability to incorporate fall, personal fall arrest equipment through a back harness D-ring uh, assembly so that an individual working at, working at heights that needs fall protection as well as high visibility can achieve both with the same garment. Um, some more examples. All right, and class one is, is really um, for low risk areas. Um, the best example I have is um, where there is some separation, um, for example, a parking lot, a, a person who is retrieving shopping carts. You're in a controlled environment. People are expected to go slow. Um, they're moving in and out of spaces, going you know, in somewhere between uh, you know, 20 miles an hour, 15 miles an hour, 10 miles an hour to stopping and actually maneuvering in both directions, forward and backwards. Um, and there's not much competition for the, for the workers' attention. They can pay attention to moving traffic, moving vehicles, as well as what they're doing. And um, the expectation is that cars are moving very slowly in this area. Um, I hear some parking lot attendants, um, warehouse delivery people, and some delivery vehicles. Uh, I just want to touch on... Um, the development of the 207 standard. Um, as I said, the 107 standard has been around since 1999. And uh, the National Traffic Incident Management Coalition um, approached ISEA to do a standard specifically for high visibility vests um, that takes into account some of the, the um, specific risks and needs of the public safety environment and industry. So we undertook that um, project with the understanding that um, there are competing hazards that exist for public safety employees and that they also need high visibility um, apparel. And so they need a garment that allows them to accomplish their tasks and access other equipment that they need to do their primary job, but also that they can wear high visibility garments to keep them safe and keep them visible when they're doing these jobs in traffic areas. Uh, the scope of the 207 standard, again, establishes performance requirements, minimum areas, minimum washing cycles, and, and also states that the retroreflective material has to be placed in, to uh, provide 360 degree visibility of the wearer. Uh, there's a, a couple things I wanted to touch on that are, this is common in both standards, but it's really important to define what you need to look for as a user. 
there are certain requirements in both standards for the certification of the materials that go into the final finished garment. And we define certify as for, the, for as it applies to background and retroreflective material, is com, uh, obtaining compliance certification documents based on testing from an independent third party accredited laboratory to verify performance requirements as specified in the standard. So there are third party testing requirements for both the background material and the retroreflective material prior to them being assembled into a finished garment. There are also certification requirements for the finished garment. And we define certify as it applies to a finished vest in the 207 standard as well as all finished goods in the 107 standard as to provide documentation from e either an independent third party laboratory or to self-certify through the use of the compliance certificate. So to certify the finished garment, you have the option or the manufacturer has the option of, of certifying by a third party independent laboratory or to self-certify. In either case, there are required documents. The standard requires documentation that the user should ask for. Um, there are performance requirements for color, retroflective, for day and night, and for fluorescence. Um, for the 207, there's also some optional criteria for um, that, they, that people may want to include. And for example, there's an optional criteria for pockets. Uh, and there's criteria that that pocket cannot contain gaps in the material that's greater than about two inches. Uh, again, panels for different identification are limited to 72 square inches. And we included, as Harry uh, had the slide of um, a European uh, site where uh, many emergency responders were. And you could see, in addition to how visible the vests were and the individuals wearing them were, they had the ability to identify which public sector industry they were associated with. So if there's, a multiple, if there's a site where there's multiple responder industries, such as law enforcement, the FBI, um, the sheriff's department, uh, the fire service, or, or others, um, you have the ability to kind of create your own identification panel through the use of color and or design, logo, logo as well as um, you know, lettering. And with this, the initial 2006 version of the 207 standard, um, we tried to keep it simple. And in this first version, we limited it to three different colors. Um, and that's fire is red, police is blue, and EMS is green. And we, we got a lot of comments when the, the standard went out for public comment that we should be including we, you know, many, many, many different colors. Um, and, and we probably will and, and consider input from other user groups that want their color included in the revision of the 207 standard. But for now, uh, we, we just decided to do the most three, what seemed like the three most popular. There's also a optional criteria for tearaway feature. And this is optional because um, this is a type of feature that allows a garment to be removed from the body with a certain amount of force, either at the sides or at the shoulders, or even certain snapping closures up front and the center could be considered a tearaway feature. And we did not um, go through the exercise of defining tearaway as it means as a means to how much force is required to pull the garment off the body and so forth. So we left it as, for, as specifically for law enforcement or other people um, that have either the hazard of being caught in or near something or if somebody grabs their garments, they want it to be released from their body or, or, or other things that perhaps we haven't considered. But it is an option and um, it's one that, that is used by many industries. Um, these are just some, some drawings of examples uh, that are appropriate and compliant. Uh, different, this is a very popular one that incorporates many features. This happens to tear away at the shoulders. Um, it has a ability to identify a little identification badge in front. It also has a loop for a communication device uh, at the shoulder. 
Uh, this one has pockets incorporated and it actually has a design feature at the waist so that it allows it to be somewhat um, adjustable to different body sizes. Um, here's some, some, these just happen to um, incorporate uh, the, the lime yellow and uh, this is just one design of, of many that are available uh, to achieve the 207 standard at Hammonds v. Police. Um, that's a, this happens to be a photo of um, the adjustable type vest um, and that's for fire. Um, a couple things that, I, I, that are really important for users to understand is there are appendices associated with both the 107 and the 207 standards and those are test report forms and I, I, I discussed this a little bit um, a little bit ago that Third-party certification of the background material and the retroreflective material is a requirement of both standards. And there are test report forms. They cannot just write it on a napkin. Um, the test report forms are mandatory. And more importantly, they're free. Uh, they're designed for everybody to use. Any laboratory in the United States or in the world can download the required testing report forms from the ISCA website, which I will give you at the end of my presentation. And they have to use those report forms. So if they're on something else, it doesn't meet the standard. Um, the same for the um, certification requirements for the end garment. You can so have it certified by um, a third party organization, or you can self certify it if you're the manufacturer. If you self-certify it, you have to use the certification compliance certificate. It has to be completed. It has to be signed by a legally authorized uh, mem member of the organization. Um, it's very specific. So um, these are the things that you absolutely need to look for as a user. In addition, um, I get a lot of questions about garment labeling as well. Garment labeling is a requirement of both standards. If a garment doesn't have the ANSI ISCA 107 or 207 label, it doesn't meet either standard. It can look like it does. Um, it can look just like a garment that does, but it, it doesn't have, uh, if it doesn't have a label, if it doesn't have the testing report forms or the compliance certificate, it doesn't meet the standard. Those are not optional requirements of either standard. They are requirements. Um, and something else I, I might want to add, because we're going to be going through on November 24th when the, um, the federal highway rule goes into effect, the visibility rule goes into effect. The time between that and when the um, revision of the MUTCD takes place that incorporates the 207 standard, there, there is going to be some time that um, people may want to use 207 garments but won't be able to. Uh, there is nothing in either standard, the 107 standard or the 207 standard, that prohibits dual labeling of garments. And it is possible to achieve compliance with both standards in a single garment. So that's something to look for to ask your manufacturer or distributor for if you, if you desire it. Um, and this is the website where all these documents are available. Um, as I said, you can download them for free. And, uh, and look for them as well as labeling in selecting your 107 or 207 garments. Thank you very much for having me today. Um, and I believe we're going to be taking some questions. Correct. All right, well, thank you, Janice and Hari. We do have a few minutes to take some questions. For those of you who are viewing this online, if you will look um, just above the screen where you're seeing the speaker, you'll see a little icon up there that says Ask. If you click on Ask, you can submit questions and we will do our best to answer them. Um, if we do not get to all your questions, we will likely post them up on the WorkZone Clearinghouse um, on the listserv and look for answers up there and so you can share information with each other. I'm sorry, on the blog, not the listserv, on the WorkZone Clearinghouse blog, so we'll put the questions there. All right, first question. This seems to be more geared um, for something that Janice might answer, but I'll leave it to you. Um, the question is, because of the required background and retroreflective materials uh, areas that are required, safety vest manufacturing companies do not manufacture small and medium-sized safety vests that meet the ANSI standard. 
that's a problem for especially with small and medium sized employees. Is there a way to address this issue? Are there any alternative vests that can be used to fit small and medium sized employees? Or is there some kind of variance or waiver that can be applied for? Um, there, there is no variance or waiver for any parts of the standard. Um, I, I think the biggest, the way to answer that is you need to look for different designs. Some of the traditional designs that are made and mass produced may not fit as well as you'd like them for, for a smaller size person. Uh, that doesn't mean that there aren't designs uh, that, that are appropriate and that do both meet the standard as well as fit an individual. So you're going to have to look at um, you know, perhaps going to a partial sleeve to a accomplish the, uh, the total areas. Uh, that might not be your first choice, but you, you will have to look at alternate designs um, because the areas of retroreflective and background material were chosen because those are the areas that have been identified as being necessary to see you at 1,000 feet. So um, you, you need to, I would encourage you to look for different designs. Um, the safetyequipment.org website has um, a, uh, a link to many, many manufacturers that can provide assistance in fitting some, some of the needs of the smaller individual. Very good. Uh, the next question we have is in the volunteer EMS service, so a lot of ambulance type companies that are volunteer, are they allowed or required to wear the ANSI public safety vest as well? I think Harry answered that in his presentation. But. Well, the, as the rule stands now, the standard which they all have to comply with the ANSI 107-2004. So that's the kind of type of garment they will have to, uh, class two or class three, uh, that's the type of garment they will have to wear starting the November, 2000, uh, November 24, uh, 2008. And that's regardless of who they are, if they're in the Regard right of way exactly. or the Federal Aid Highway. Exactly. The only exception is, again, for the law enforcement officers. Um, here's another question that's kind of along those same lines, and I think we may know the answer, but it's to ask about what about reporters who may be on site um, doing a report from the side of a road? Are they required to uh, wear the vest if they're in the right of way? Yes, they do. Um, again, the, the, the way the worker definition is, uh, we, we have developed the definition, there is no exception for the reporters. So they will also be, uh, they are included in this definition and they will have to wear those garments. Okay. Um, another question here, is the vests that were compliant with the 107-1999 standard, are they still, do they comply with the newer standards? Are they still compliant? The 19 version, 1999 version of the 107 standard essentially doesn't exist anymore. There is no grandfather clause for garments that meet an older version of the standard. Um, the only way that you can have a, one, a 1999 garment meet the tool be a value, you have to have, have it evaluated and the same test forms apply. Uh, you have to have the garment evaluated to the requirements of the 2004 standard, and they'll have to be relabeled. Um, but I, most of those older garments, I, I don't even, I don't get that question very much anymore. It's usually more common in the first year of the revision of the document, where some of the older gar, the older garments um, still exist through some distribution channels. But um, I. I don't really know of any that exist anymore, but anyway, the only way to wear one that would meet the 2004 standard is to have it reevaluated, tested, certified um, to the new version of the standard. Um, very good. Another question deals with the labs that certify them, and the question, do they have to be U.S. labs or can a foreign lab like one in China certify to this standard? The standard does not state the or country of origin of the, of the test house. Very good. Uh, this is a question perhaps for Hari, and the question is, what is the right of way of a federal aid highway? What does that mean? <laughs> uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, in the, so most of the interstates and freeways, uh, there is a, either fence or some sort of markers for the uh, public uh, right of way line. But the uh, but the most of our two-lane roads, there is no marker, and there—that's that, the, what the, the definition of public right-of-way is: the uh, the land 
uh, acquired by the, the um, government for the trans highway purposes. So it usually extends beyond the shoulders and uh, in, in, in the curbs, but there is no visible marker. So, but the, the general rule of thumb is that if you are in the vicinity of, uh, of a high vis, then you should wear the high vis degree garment. Very good. Um, a couple of questions that are just coming up here. Um, this again, uh, I think we've addressed this, but you know, it says we sponsor adopt a highway type um, programs. Um, picking up trash and volunteers, they're required as well, we would assume. Absolutely, and again, uh, we believe that those safety benefits of high visibility should extend to all workers, so they are included in this rule. Another question has come up. Um, it mentioned specifically in your slide, Janice, that flaggers would wear typically a Class 3 garment. Are they required to wear a Class 3, or is a Class 2 ever appropriate? It really depends on the whole risk assessment evaluation that I went through in, in my presentation. Uh, it depends where the flagger is. Um, I, I mean, as a rule, an, a flagger at nighttime would require class three. But you need to go through the process of risk assessment, um, where the flagger is, where they're located, if there's any um, separation between vehicles. I mean, the whole, the whole assessment that I that I laid out in my presentation. That will lead you to what type of garment they need. And, in, and if there's any uncertainty, go to the higher level garment. All right. Another question, which is interesting, um, given that um, how standards are enforced by Federal Highway, but who will enforce this standard and how will it be enforced? The, uh, uh, the Federal Highway Administration has authority to withhold the federal aid money from the states. Uh, if they are not in compliance with the federal regulations. So that's the Federal Highway Administration's authority. Uh, but beyond that, uh, there are two more components of why the agency would want to uh, consider uh, complying with this uh, regulation. One is the safety. That's a paramount, and you would want to make your workers safe, safer. And uh, also, there is a bigger issue of uh, legal liability that if your workers are not in compliance with the federal regulations, and if they get into the crash, uh, then there is a, there's a legal liability which you will have to uh, deal with. Uh, but the Federal Highway Administration's authority is to withhold the uh, federal aid money from the states. And that's enforcement uh, mechanism we have. Uh, any comments further on that, Janice? I mean, I don't want to speak for the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. They're not here, but I know that their newest version that they have adopted of the MUTCD does not include this new provision. However, I do know that they have enforced certain standards like this through their um, 5A1 citation. So they that have. May be a um, OSHA and the Department of Labor, as well as many state plan states for OSHA, have um, listed citations uh, for failure to provide appropriate measures for, to avoid struck by hazards. And those struck by hazards obviously could mean motor vehicles as well as moving equipment in, in, in a work zone. Um, or other types of moving equipment, whether it's, um, for example, a ship cargo and you get hit by a forklift. I mean, any struck by hazards, um, OSHA has been citing for the employer for failure to provide appropriate measures to avoid an incident. And that's how they have, uh, since none of the regulations specifically um, call out visibility, um, that's the mechanism that both federal OSHA and many state plan states, including California, has. Um, is adopted. Very good. There seems to be a, several questions that have come up here regarding the what is the um, uh, exemption for law enforcement at the present time? How does that work? What does that mean? Uh, this rule applies to law enforcement officers when they are in their when they are doing the traffic control. So if they are working in the work zones, they are doing the crash investigations or if they are um, controlling traffic, suppose the uh, traffic signal light goes out and there's a police officer controlling traffic. In those type of situations, uh, they will have to wear the high visibility garment. But when they are in uh, law enforcement role, such as giving, issuing the citations or you know, you know, in the police chase, those type of situations, they don't have to wear the high visibility garment. And I think those, uh, the examples are spelled out in the rule that when and where this rule applies to law enforcement officers. 
Okay. And the other one, um, what about, uh, we see uh, some questions from the firefighters and those people that wear the Kevlar that already has retroreflective material on them. How does it apply to the firefighter and EMS service? Um, I'm, actually, that's a very good question. I, wanted, I meant to include that because I get a lot of questions from the fire service. Um, mostly the question I get is, does my turnout gear meet the 2004 standard and therefore meet the requirements of the new uh, worker visibility rule that's Federal Highways imposed? And the answer is, again, you have to have it evaluated to compliance with the standard. Um, there isn't anybody that you can just have take a look at it and say, you know, that looks about right. Um, there are requirements for, again, certification of the materials and the finished garment, and it needs to be uh, evaluated and documented to ensure, because all turnout gear doesn't have the same areas and it doesn't have the same designs and, and so forth, and certainly doesn't have all the same placement and color of retroflective material on the garment from fire service to fire service. So um, it has to be evaluated, and again, the, those forms are available on uh, safetyequipment.org website, and they're free. Very good. Um, some questions have come up, and I know you addressed this briefly, about other colors besides those are specified. I think people have seen, like over in Europe, the use of blue or, or other colors for different services. Um, some have talked about having retroreflective colors in browns and such. How do those all play into this standard? Well, we, got, we have several comments that certain sheriff's departments wanted brown as opposed to blue. Um, others, you know, there, there was a whole host of them. And, and the, we went with the overwhelming majority of comments that we received in the end that law enforcement was a dark blue that fire was red and that EMS was green. Um, most of the comments that we got were, again, certain types of law enforcement wanted a different color, such as brown or tan. Those are not really popular retroreflective colors. They're not really visible colors. Um, so again, in the end, we went with the most popular uh, the, the overwhelming number of comments we got was that blue was appropriate, and that's what we went with. We did get several other comments to incorporate different types of colors um, for different types of, of responder communities, responder industries, and, um, and that won't be taken up until the 2007 um, document is revised. Very that good. Uh, I do have a question for you because the standard is 107 2004. Are there specific colors included in 107 standard? There, there were the fluorescent green, there's orange. Oh, yeah, th those, th those colors are the same, and, and they, did, they have not changed. They're exactly the same in the 1999 version. Uh, the 2004 version have the exact requirements for performance for background and retroflective material. And actually, the 2004 version is due to be updated in 2009, and everything is exactly the same. So those types of requirements that are fundamental to the standard have not changed, and I don't anticipate that they will change. So, um, and we get this com uh, the questions a lot, that what color garment they can choose. So that since the standard is 107 and 2004, and within that standard, there are three basic colors. There's uh, orange, red, and the lime green, as you mentioned that. So those are the colors, and the, uh, the combination of uh, those colors will be okay, too. Uh, also, you know, previously you asked the questions about the requirement of this rule for the flaggers. The, uh, the flaggers are already covered under the MUTCD. So MUTCD already have the requirements for the flaggers for the uh, high visibility garment. So if, if, if somebody wants to look at the, what applies to the flaggers, they should be looking at the MUTCD language. Very good. Next question. Um, I, I just want to clarify, that's the current version of the MUTCD that has those requirements. Exactly. And what I was referring to is the optional color criteria for identification. You know, peop, some groups want to have fire that says, you know, in red letters or law enforcement or police in blue letters. I was not referring to the actual color of the background material for clarification. Okay, thank you. Um, 
the new standard talks about using the use of class three at night. Uh, is that always mandated or is it, what is the difference and when would you use a class two and class three? When is it re absolutely required to wear a class three? Well, the uh, worker visibility rule does not uh, make the distinction whether the when you have to wear the class two and when you have to wear class three. Uh, if you're wearing either class two or class three, you will be in the compliance. But within your agency, as Janice mentioned, that you need to do this risk assessment and come up with the appropriate uh, class uh, for your workers. So as far as you're wearing class two or class three, you will be in compliance with the worker visibility rule. Very good. Another question comes with the use of retroreflective and high visibility for fluorescent material on hard hats. Can that be done, say you have a small bodied person and you need to have more area exposed, what is the use of, uh, you know, what is the applicability of this rule to the use of hard hats? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll tackle this one. Um, the current standard, uh, the 2004 standard, is for high visibility apparel and headwear. Um, the requirement for headwear is 10 square inches. You can achieve that with any knit either, a, you know, a baseball cap, a knitted cap, a hard hat, it is not a huge area to cover. So if you have a, a small circumference head and a size small hard hat, knitted cap, baseball cap, whatever, achieving 10 square inches of retroreflective material is not difficult and should not be prohibitive in any way to individuals wearing that equipment. All right, we have a couple of questions regarding the materials used, um, such as is mesh um, an appropriate material to use? Another question is, you know, if mesh is not available, what do you deal with worker safety and the heat that comes from having to wear a vest and uh, et cetera, et cetera? Um, the 2004 standard actually has um, performance cr criteria for background material that it is knitted as well as woven. Uh, that was a new criteria in the revision of the standard. And it allows for um, a lot of different types of materials, uh, more, more natural fibers. There are actually some approaching 100% cotton that are available. Uh, many of them, I, I don't use the word mesh because um, mesh is different things to different people. The fact is there are some more open weave garments that allow a, a little more breathability. Uh, and there are certain styles, for example, that incorporate um, large weave material that would not necessarily meet the requirements of the background material but are used as accents under the arm for additional ventilation or as a panel in the back for additional ventilation. You can utilize those types of ventilation um, options but you cannot include that area as contributing to the overall area of the garment, for example, that meets the table one in the standard. Um, but there are many open weaves. I mean, we got a lot of comments when we revised the standard uh, that allows for more open weave types. Some refer to them as mesh. But there's some really open weaves that would not meet the requirements of the standard. And I guess the short answer is if it meets the requirements um, of the background material sections of the standard, then it, it meets the standard. Okay, I think we have time for just one final question, and this deals with the new 2007 standard or the newest standard revision that's coming up. When will the new standard um, be enforced? Will it be applied? Uh, which new standard? The new um, 107, the, the, 2007 version? No, that's the 207 standard is the public safety vest standard, and it is a 2006 version. And we don't anticipate that being revised for probably at least two more years. And the 2004 standard? Uh, probably at the end of next year. It's on a five-year revision cycle, both are. Very good, very good. Well, I think our time is now up, and so we would like to thank Janice and Hari for participating with us today. As a reminder to our viewers, if you um, had some technical difficulties viewing this, would like to go back and look at it again, this entire program will be available on the Work Zone Clearinghouse. That's at www.workzonesafety.org. Um, it's probably all over the screen as you're looking at it now. And you'll be able to uh, watch that presentation live by clicking on the icon at the top of the screen that says Video Vault. 
We'll also talk to Janice and Hari, and if possible, we will make the PowerPoint presentations available for download also from the site. So thank you very much for joining us today. We appreciate your attention and participation, and we look forward to seeing you at our next uh, webinar and also, again, reminding you to join us in March in Orlando for the WorkZone Conference. Thank you so much.